This is the most complex and sophisticated machine ever made. In six minutes, it will be traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. In eight minutes, the humans inside will no longer feel the pull of the Earth's gravity. When the 20th century started, humans couldn't even fly. As it ends, they're flying where no creature has ever flown. And they do it with rockets. Rockets aren't new. Neither is the idea of riding them to the heavens. One night in the 16th century, a Chinese nobleman, Wan Hu, prepared himself for liftoff. But then there was, as modern spacemen say, a glitch. And though Wan Hu didn't make it to the stars, he couldn't be found on the face of the Earth, either. For 400 years more, spaceflight was confined to dreams and rockets to fireworks. But this century saw rockets take a deadly trajectory. It was alcohol, not gunpowder, that propelled Germany's infamous V2s to London, but the principle was the same. A rocket is essentially a high-tech version of a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon in the sense of a child's balloon. Uh, what a rocket does is have a barely contained explosion to generate high-pressure, high-temperature gas that's contained in a cavity. And that gas then squirts out at very high speed out a little hole, but it's still a barely contained explosion. Sounds simple, but in their post-war rocketry, both Americans and Soviets found that containing the explosions was the tricky part. The U.S. and the Soviets were caught up in a space race. Both wanted to be the first to put a human in orbit. And in 1961, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to leave the planet. He had ridden into space on top of the powerful Vostok rocket, and he hadn't been blown to bits. The U.S. reacted to the setback by concentrating on a new race. A race to the moon. They had the technology, the urgency, and the money. At the Kennedy Space Center, they built a vehicle assembly building, so large that a 45-story office building could fit through its doorway. The moon rockets would be carried from there to the launch tower on the world's largest land vehicle. Everything to do with moon rockets was colossal. The 360-foot-high engine test stand at Huntsville, Alabama, has more concrete in it than the Great Pyramid has stone. In 1960, when five Saturn engines were tested at the same time, the roar could be heard a hundred miles away. All that power was needed. The ship that was going to be lifted off the planet, the Saturn V, was longer than a football field and weighed as much as 30 locomotives. Zero.
takes a top speed of 25,000 miles an hour to fly to the moon. If you're in a hurry to make a rocket ship that will do that, the quickest way, though not the most economical, is to make one that burns in stages. Make three rocket ships. When the first one has used up its fuel, it simply drops off. That leaves the second one with a much lighter load to push. The spacecraft goes faster, and then the second stage drops away. Then the third engine fires, slings the ship around the Earth, and shoots it towards the moon. And so the age-old dream of humankind came true. But since it was last used in the early 70s, rocketry has been refined. Most rockets don't need to be nearly this huge anymore. Rockets are mainly business now. Slimmer, more cost-effective machines built to carry useful, profitable satellites into stationary orbits. Orbits time to move with the rotation of the Earth so that the effect is to hang still in the sky. They've brought cellular phones, hundreds of channels of television, accurate weather reporting, mapping, navigation, space astronomy. All these things and dozens more have changed the world the satellites hover above. And much of the rocketry that puts the satellites there comes from the Lockheed Martin factory near Denver. It's one of the largest rocket factories in the world, making what are now the largest U.S. rockets, Titan 4Bs. These, along with the smaller Atlas and Centaur rockets, each hundreds of millions of dollars worth of precision equipment are put together on an assembly line, just as if they were jet planes or Chevrolets. It takes about 3,000 people to make these rockets, but only about 200 are actually involved in their final assembly. Some of them working like surgeons in the so-called clean room. The upper stage centaurs have to be clean because the satellites they carry really have to be clean. Any bit of dirt that lands on a lens or a mirror or in the inner workings will, in outer space, stay there for a satellite's lifetime, perhaps permanently impairing its performance. the Titan, getting wired up. Titans are the workhorses of the U.S. rocket fleet, built to take the heaviest loads, up to 20 tons. Titan started life as a weapon, a ballistic missile, but its first space use was to launch humans, the Gemini missions, the preparation for the moon landing. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Today, it's commercial, and though it costs about $300 million to make, each launch brings millions in profit. And launching satellites, like any big business, is international. The European rocket fleet, Ariane, launched from French Guiana, carries most of the world's biggest commercial payloads. 24, the Japanese have H-2 rockets. They have plans for moon orbiters, a space shuttle, and a space station. The closer a launching pad is to the equator, the less power is needed to get the rocket up, which is why Ariane goes from Guiana 
and the H-2 is launched from one of Japan's most southerly islands. Subtropical Tanegashima, which makes it more fuel efficient than if it were launched from Tokyo. But what happens when a far northern country wants to get into the satellite business? Around the oil-rich North Sea, there are plenty of used drilling platforms. And now Norwegian, U.S. and Ukrainian companies have teamed up to convert a 31,000-ton platform into a launch pad to be towed to the equator. Rockets are assembled on the ship, transferred to the platform, winched up, pointed at the sky, and launched eastwards, parallel to the equator. The reason an equatorial launch saves fuel is that the planet turns fastest where it's the thickest, and the spinning speed of the globe there gives the rocket an extra boost. The rocket also has a shorter distance to reach geostationary orbit. In this orbit, 25,000 miles high, satellites travel around the Earth once every 24 hours. But when space stations are up and running, even cheaper rockets will be needed. Today's rockets are so expensive because they're used once and thrown away. Rockets regularly visiting space stations like this one will need to be reusable. And that was the original reason for building the space shuttle. Work on the shuttle started in 1972. It was supposed to ferry passengers and supplies into orbit, spend up to three weeks there, and then fly back to Earth like an airline. The shuttle's budget was tight, though, and didn't allow for all the necessary technology to be developed. And it was never entirely what it was meant to be, a simple, reusable spaceship. It now costs up to half a billion dollars a launch. Even so, it's still a hell of a machine. And people who have seen a launch never forget it. Rocket Ships is brought to you in part by IBM, solutions for a small planet, and by Acura, the true definition of luxury, yours. In closing, Todd. Uh, we think it's extremely insulting that some people get the best equipment. A think pad. But we have to schlep around these slow, ugly, cheesy pieces of. You can't write that. So, nice working for you, Todd. Enjoy the rest of your silly, political, little life. What are you doing, Phil? Period, set. It's your new ThinkPad. Unsend. 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 ThinkPad. It's what they want. And now, you can afford to give it to them. Nick, there is still one missile left. You must get to it before the others do. It's a 200-horsepower engine, too audacious to be kept secret. It's advanced climate control, engineered to keep you cool, no matter what kind of pressure you're under. Son's birthday. It's the TL from Acura. The true definition of luxury. Yours. Long live Rome, and on to victory. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. Brutus! When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. Someday, jet aeroplanes will be invisible to radar waves. Imagine man-made moons helping us to communicate. Tomorrow, electronic highways in the sky will guide air travelers to their destination. Year after year, Lockheed Martin takes the most amazing ideas about the future makes them fly. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his display? 
still be cruising during the big sale at Neenam and Asher Ford because a Carnival Cruise for Two is included with every new or used car, truck, or van this week from our huge inventory. Exotic ports of call, eight meals a day, great entertainment, and great deals like factory financing from 0.9% or rebates up to $2,000, plus now additional Ford loyalty bonuses. This is the time to buy. What a function, holy cow, you never believe it if your friends could see you now. The big sale only at Nina Manasha Ford. I had a plan. It was all planned. Do you know the signs of suicide? You know the old line. If at first you don't succeed. I just wanted the pain to go away. Suicide. Take it seriously. To get all its 2,000 tons of dead weight off the ground, the shuttle relies on solid fuel packed inside the white boosters. Once high in the atmosphere, the huge external tank filled with liquid hydrogen takes over. The chief designer for this most intricate of machines is Max Faget. Well, there's our shuttle. When it's all fueled up, and ready to launch, it'll weigh almost five million pounds, which is a great deal more than we expected. The original idea was to have a vehicle that could carry astronauts up to the space station and back down, and perhaps a little bit of cargo. So it was designed to carry about 5,000 pounds, maybe a little bit more, with a crew of perhaps six. However, as time went by, a lot more uses for the shuttle were invented, and it was decided that it should be able to carry as much as 60,000 pounds. And of course, that made the thing an awful lot bigger. The shuttle is now the main source of human access to space. Ten or so are launched every year, each one carrying from five to seven astronauts. 220 people, including 27 women, have been shuttled into orbit, and there have been 90 launches so far. Even so, this 1997 takeoff is the first that Max Faget, who worked at Houston Space Center, has ever seen in person. Riding upwards on a 600-foot trail of flame, the shuttle is a sight to behold. Boy, that is right! time I've seen a launch since Al Shepard went to the moon. And, and they're, they're just outstanding to listen to that noise. Of course, I've been watching them all on TV, which you can see a lot more, but to be here and see the thing live and hear, the, hear that tremendous crackling roar of the, of the launch, it's really been something else. And that's a great ship, I'll tell you. It, it doesn't meet everybody's requirements, but it's a super ship, and we're all proud of it. The solid fuel boosters burn out in two minutes and are dropped into the sea, 160 miles from the launch pad. The shuttle is now powered only by the main engines. In four minutes, it empties the tank of 440,000 gallons. The tank will now break up. It's the only part of the operation that has to be wasted. As high as 370 miles up, the astronauts go to work. The shuttle crew can even pull up alongside satellites and repair them. Here, they're fitting eyeglasses on the faulty lenses of the Hubble telescope a job that later helped astronomers see hundreds of things never seen before. Final pre -clear maneuver of the As 
amazing a vehicle as the shuttle is, there are elements of the 1972 jalopy about it. Its guidance computer, for instance, still uses cathode ray tubes, and the steel bearings in the oxygen turbo have to be replaced every second flight. Or did, until the shuttle engineers, along with the world of dentistry, caught up with some modern technology. A dentist drill operates under many of the same conditions as the bearings in the shuttle. They both have to withstand stresses at very high speeds. And in recent years, drills and bearings have both switched from steel to the much tougher ceramic, silicon nitride. Now the shuttle's bearings only need changing every 10 flights. Silicon nitride has saved the program millions. There are many other ways that new technology is improving the shuttle. In the main engine, for instance. No other engine in the world operates at such extremes or at such a range of temperatures, from freezing liquid hydrogen to burning gas. But that doesn't mean it can't be improved. Take the fuel injectors. They determine how well the fuel mixes with the oxygen. The better the mix, the more efficient the engine. This is an optical patternator, which uses lasers to look for possible improvements. It's a tribute to the shuttle's basic design that it can be updated a piece at a time. What will finally outdate it, though, are these, the next generation of lighter and more powerful space planes. It's a 170 horsepower race bread engine. It's double wishbone suspension that slices, dices, and Julianne's corners. It's quite possibly all the fun you need. It's the Integra from Acura. The true definition of luxury. Yours. of nature they create life but out of control can take it away raging with amazing intensity searing heat rising and spreading for days the tools to fight them the science that predicts them the people who face them until you've been there you won't believe the power raging planet fire followed by flood premiering tomorrow at 8 eastern 7 central only on the discovery channel But for a whole new approach to landing, not to mention takeoff, there's Clipper Graham. Built in the U.S. by McDonnell Douglas, it's the kind of rocket ship Buck Rogers would have used, and it's the first completely self-contained spacecraft ever made. In this Air Force test flight at White Sands, New Mexico, it demonstrates a talent never before seen in a rocket. It can go up into the sky and just stop. Just hover there. It can tilt and fly laterally. And when it's ready, it can reverse straight back down to the launching pad. Rather, it could do this because Clipper Graham is no more. Landing accelerator coming up to slow the vehicle further. Landing small negative. Down, descending toward touchdown. Way on gear, in shutdown. This was only an experimental prototype. After four successful flights, it crashed and burned. Maybe it knew something. Maybe that the contract for the next U.S. space plane had been given to Lockheed Martin and the X-33. This will replace the shuttle. And many of its best features are the result of lessons learned from the shuttle. 
Even when testing models in wind tunnels, there are new technologies undreamt of when the shuttle was being developed. The phosphor thermography is a method where we coat ceramic wind tunnel models with fluorescent crystals, such as this one here. We illuminate the model with an ultraviolet lamp during a wind tunnel run, and the model then glows with an intensity which is temperature dependent. Uh, looks like we're ready to run when y'all are. Uh, we don't need a calibration or anything, and it'll be a 250, 450, and we're giving you permissives. So, just by looking at the colors, the scientists can tell how the X-33 will be affected by the re-entry heat. But for absolute precision, the wind tunnel information is transferred to computer. Other design components are being tested. This stress test simulates the extreme temperatures from launch to re-entry landing on part of the X-33's lightweight reusable fuel tank, which must withstand temperatures that range from 350 degrees to minus 420 degrees. And then there's the stress of going to space. A titanium sandwich joint? Where is the breaking point? When will it surrender to the pressure? Under this tension, metals can be ripped apart with a deafening bang. This time, the battle between the test machine itself and the joint was a draw. The X-33 will have a special engine, the Aerospike, which automatically adapts to give the best possible performance at every speed and altitude. And so it has to be tested at every speed and altitude. At least every speed and altitude that a Blackbird spy plane can reach. The X-33 is scheduled to launch in 1999. It will be distinctive for having no wings, or being all wing, a flying wing. And though it will weigh half as much as the shuttle, it will carry the same weight. Even better, it will be completely reusable. It will make space flight routine. It will be able to do what the shuttle was originally intended to do service space stations and service more than space stations maybe because when space travel becomes so easy and relatively cheap there's no reason why it should be limited to professional astronauts how about a honeymoon in a space hotel the height of uh, this hotel would be about 240 meters and the diameter is 140 meters and the distance is rotating three times a minute the size of guest rooms Length is about 7.5 meters, and the diameter is about 4 meters. So very, very comfortable, because uh, we have a gravity of 0 0.7 G. Uh, we have 64 guests we can uh, invite for this hotel. But the most interesting portion is this zero-gravity area. So we can enjoy the zero-gravity sports uh, games. <laughs> All you need for this kind of future is cheap rocketry. Or maybe not rocketry at all. Rocket Chips is brought to you in part by Isuzu, specialized worldwide builders of adventure machines. Isuzu, go farther. By Pennzoil, formulated for stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. And by Skytel. Get caller ID from Skytel and find out who's paging before you call. I was born. are made for rolling, mules are made to pack. Now, for a limited time, get a 98 Trooper for $2.99 per month for 48 months with 1943 due at least signing. Or receive 1,000 cash back with purchase during the Isuzu Go Farther Getaway event. Offer ends May 31st. Everywhere I go, people ask me, Arnie, is that old tractor you drove in the Pennzoil commercial still running? <laughs> It's hard to believe that that was 20 years ago. 
Back in 78, Pennzoil asked me if they could use my dad's old tractor for a TV commercial because we used Pennzoil. Well, that started a long relationship, 20 years for me, and the old tractor turns 50 this year. And thanks to Pennzoil, we're both still running pretty good. Stop. Go. Pennzoil. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. The U.S. Postal Service, with new automated systems from Lockheed Martin, is speeding the delivery of billions of pieces of mail and the occasional birthday present from Uncle Will. Interestingly, Lockheed Martin is also building America's next generation of fighter planes, which means we not only help deliver the present, but the future. Look, they make olive oil. Take a picture here. Uh, all right. Bonjour. Oh, hi. <laughs> How are you? Is this your business? Yes. Oh, we have our own business, too. Yes, yes, we have three stores in Ohio. Ohio. We sell it in Ohio. In California, in Canada, in Argentina, in Australia. They're on the Internet. How can they afford it? You're watching the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. Bring the excitement and wonder of the Discovery Channel into your home today. Call now and order your own copy of the program you're watching and explore your world again and again. Real world entertainment at your fingertips. The Discovery Channel. Bring it home. Call now and order this program for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Or send a check or money order to the address on your screen. Your total satisfaction is guaranteed, so order now. launch systems of the future are not going to be rockets. These machines are going to be incredibly energetic. They're going to be so powerful that you'll be able to idle to orbit in such a machine. The rocket is a remarkable achievement and we've accomplished many wonderful things with it. Um, but you have to realize that the, uh, the rocket has to carry all of its propellant on board in huge mass of fuel tanks. It's very much to me like sitting in the back of a boat trying to propel it by chucking cannonballs out the back end. Imagine the opportunity of designing a vehicle to fly on remote power beam to the vehicle, a light craft. The light craft is a completely different approach to space travel, or any kind of travel for that matter. A laser is driving this. When the high energy light hits the back of the mirrored circle, the air behind it gets so hot, it explodes and shoots the light craft forward. White Sands Missile Range. Mirabeau and his team work here, trying to create a system that could make rockets obsolete. And using some of the world's most powerful lasers, Leftovers from President Reagan's Star Wars program, which was based here. These beams of concentrated light can travel hundreds of thousands of miles without losing any focus, and Mirabeau believes that they could drive a ship into outer space. We're now preparing for an actual free flight experimental launch of a laser boosted light craft. We've set the model here on a short wire launcher and we have to spin the model like a child's top or gyroscope so that it will automatically point at the laser beam during boost. So now we'll spin this up right before launch. Laser on, air explodes and the model rises to the stars, or in this case, the ceiling. The landing is tricky, too. After all, this model is worth about $4,000 and is easily damaged.
models, Mirabeau is gradually increasing both the scale and the detail. Within five years, he hopes to lift many satellites to orbit with a craft such as this. This is a full-scale model of a laser-propelled light craft. The entire vehicle is as you see it here. There are no external tanks. There's a small propellant tank inside. The front end of this is where the satellite electronics go. The whole front end of this thing becomes an inlet to make this engine supplied with air on the way to orbit. The back side of this is a large parabolic mirror, highly polished, that is designed to capture the laser beam that is projected to it from the ground onto this optic, and it focuses the laser power right inside this shroud here. When that happens, an explosion occurs as the air is rapidly heated, creating a shock wave that pushes this vehicle forward. As the beam is rapidly pulsed, the engine is continuously propelled on its way to orbit. Why should astronauts have all the fun? I, mean, I want to go to space. I can't afford it. It's too expensive. Uh, I could afford it if it was for the price of an airline ticket. And that's why I'm developing Lightcraft technology, because it would open up space to everyone. There's even a second generation of ideas about beam-powered spacecraft. Close to the Earth, the craft converts sunlight into electron beams that spin like a fan moving it in any direction. Then it flips over. An orbiting solar power station hits it with a laser or microwave blast to generate 9 billion watts of electricity. This powers a remarkable engine that forces air downwards and even pushes the atmosphere out of its path. The 60-foot craft and a dozen passengers could reach the moon in just five and a half hours. A solar-powered, virtually free ride. Outer space, by its nature, offers other opportunities for free rides. Houston, we have satellite motion. All right, we see it. In orbit, for instance, a simple piece of string gains all sorts of potential. This experiment aboard the shuttle, where a satellite is being dropped into orbit, could be a step towards launching systems that work like slingshots. This attic in San Diego, California, with its futuristic spinning wheel, belongs to Joe Carroll, a man with plans for tethers in space. One of the critical jobs in the tether business is winding the reel. The string, made of high-strength polyethylene, is miles long and must deploy freely. This is a prototype test winding with a new type of tether that is strong enough to actually tie the space shuttle to the International Space Station after it's built. And then at the end of any shuttle mission to the space station, whatever surplus propellant is left over uh, can be used to reboost the space station in a towing mode. This tether is about three kilometers long. It'll take about an hour and a half to two hours to wind. For the 20 kilometer tethers, the actual winding time is about eight hours. That's distributed over a longer period with, you know, lunch breaks and things like that. I've been a space enthusiast for 30 years and never expected my concepts that I played with as ideas to be taken seriously. But 15 years ago, NASA got interested in a concept of mine involving a way to use tethers. This led to my opportunity to build flight hardware, and it's been a great satisfaction and very thrilling to have the opportunity to fly your own hardware and actually see it in space. Launched by a rocket in 1994, this satellite tether was the first man-made object in space to be visible from Earth as anything but a point of light. It had a shape. This experiment was satisfying and exhilarating in many respects, but one of the most surprising was the fact that the tether itself was actually visible to the naked eye. It was a great surprise to many people that something about the size of a kite string would be visible from hundreds of miles away. Some people described it as a glowing Jedi sword gliding across the desert sky. <laughs> Joe's remarkable 12-mile-long tether was visible to the naked eye because it was shiny enough to reflect sunlight. Oh, that's great. Come on. That's great to may move cargo, 
maybe even manned spacecraft from Earth orbit to the surface of the moon. It's all a matter of energy transfer. When there's no atmosphere to interfere with an object's momentum, momentum can be passed from object to object. The cargo is grabbed by the tether system, then maneuvered through space to higher orbits. To get to the moon, it's a four-day trip. In lunar orbit, the parcel is caught by another tether and dropped gently down to the surface of the moon. And of course, it would work just as well in the opposite direction, which means that there could be constant traffic between Earth and moon without the cost of fuel. But the moon is just a local stop, and space, to say the least, is vast. What about going to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, a hundred billion moon distances away? Even the difference between the moon and Mars is like the difference between the house next door and one in another city. Next, the story of the real exorcist in the grip of evil and his death the end, a scientific focus, life after death on Discovery Sunday. Then searching for the number one motive, why they kill on Justice Files, coming up only on the Discovery Channel. Now, for a limited time, get a 98 Trooper for $2.99 per month for 48 months with 1943 due at least signing. Or receive 1,000 cash back with purchase during the Isuzu Go Farther Getaway event. Offer ends May 31st. Lockheed Martin have been lucky enough to work on some very exciting projects. Like the most advanced automated fingerprint identification system in the world. Oh, and let's not forget the missions to Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The tools to fight them, the science that predicts them. The people who face them. Until you've been there, you won't believe the power. Waging planet, fire followed by flood. Premiering tomorrow at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, only on the... Every year, local, state, and federal law enforcement officials arrest hundreds of people for selling illegal cable to scramblers and recover the names of thousands of customers, each of whom could face a felony conviction, serious jail time, and thousands of dollars in fines. So if you don't think using an unauthorized cable box is a crime, you should meet some of the people who do. If you're stealing cable, stop. Time Warner Cable is taking cable theft seriously. For all current owners of Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, and GM vehicles, now get $500 to $1,000 in extra cash back savings from your Ford dealer. That's $500 to $1,000 cash back in addition to all current national Ford incentives. Here's how it works. First, select your new Ford and get $750 to $1,500 cash back or choose low long-term financing. Then, take an additional $500 to $1,000. Combine the cash and save up to $2,500. This is a limited time offer. Visit your Packerland Ford store today. To travel in deep space, other technologies will be needed. Here at the Air Force Research Laboratory in the sunny Mojave Desert, they're working on solar propulsion. The pressure of sunlight on solar panels could push ships through space, or the light could be converted into power for electric motors. Or an inflatable solar concentrator like this could heat the propellant in rocket engines. This would allow for rocketry, but with much lighter fuel and much more efficiency. Nearby, a new type of fuel is tested in chambers that simulate space.
This is a pulsed plasma thruster. It heats Teflon to a temperature so high that it turns into a completely different state of matter, a plasma. This can maneuver spacecraft or satellites. But how do you invent a new rocket ship? To do that, there's a remarkable computing system that seems to turn dreams into reality. It's called rapid prototyping. A designer draws into a computer, and then another computer takes the drawings, analyzes them, and compiles them, layer by layer, into the designer's wish. This means that anything a designer can draw, the computer can make. A laser traces the designer's thoughts into a bath of liquid epoxy resin. Wherever the liquid is touched by the beam, it solidifies. Little by little, one thin cross-section at a time, three-dimensional parts are formed. And in a matter of hours, the finished object rises out of a solution bath. You can make almost anything you need with this. Spare parts on long space missions, for instance. NASA's involved in rapid prototyping, not just to reduce the cost for models used in wind tunnel or hot fire testing, but we're also involved in research to develop machines, perhaps one like this, to support the astronauts on the space station or during the exploration of other planets. Rapid prototypers could be crucial on missions to Mars. A space dock could be the launch pad for a ship that could get there. When its engine's running, a nuclear rocket ship is highly radioactive. On Earth, this is dangerous, but space is full of radiation already, and a little extra from the ship would be like pouring a glass of water into the ocean. A nuclear engine, essentially a nuclear reactor, could drive a rocket twice as fast as a chemical engine and provide a safer ride, too. To get to Mars and back using current technology, such as the chemical rocket engines on the space shuttle, will require three years. The reason for this is that it'll take you six months to get to Mars. If you spend a month or two exploring the planet, and then try to race back and catch to the Earth, it is revolved around the sun. With a nuclear rocket, we can get to Mars in three months. Then we can spend a month or two in exploration, and then we can achieve speeds of up to 30,000 miles per hour, racing back and catching the Earth before it gets too far around the sun. Thus, the total mission time round trip is about nine months. And from the crew standpoint, being out in space cut off from the Earth for only nine months is far, far safer than a three-year mission. So in my opinion, nuclear propulsion is an enabling technology. I believe that within 10 years, we can design, build, and test a nuclear rocket that will allow us to launch a manned mission to Mars. For any manned mission that goes beyond the moon, faster is better. On a three-year mission, the crew would be exposed to a radiation dose that exceeds their allowable lifetime limit. Because of the performance of the nuclear rocket, not only can we reduce the trip time, we can actually put shielding around the module in the ship on the journey between Earth and Mars. That's all right for Mars, then. But what propulsion system could be used to reach the stars? Freezing tonight, mate. Clear and cold. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. At Pennzoil, we've discovered that it's not the kind of engine you drive that matters most in motor oil. It's the way you drive. You're stuck, you go. 
You stop, you go. You stop, you go. Imagine how your engine feels. The next time you change your oil, ask for Pennzoil, specially formulated to protect your engine from stop and go driving. You okay, boy? Stop, go, Pennzoil. Did you hear Robertson's leaving? How long was he here? I don't know. Forever. Yeah. You know, he, he, he was one of the good guys. <laughs> yeah, a real team player. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, I'm gonna miss him. He will be missed. Mm. So who gets his ThinkPad? ThinkPad, it's what they're waiting for. And now you can afford to give it to them. Now, for a limited time, get a 98 Trooper for $2.99 per month for 48 months with 1943 due at least signing. Or receive 1,000 cash back with purchase during the Isuzu Go Farther Getaway event. Offer ends May 31st. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his display? For starships, it's antimatter. This, the equal and opposite of matter can be made in enormous atomic accelerators by smashing normal atoms together. I first became interested in space travel about 10 years ago. I had, uh, before that, been doing experimental particle nuclear physics, thinking in, at odd moments about how we could use the results of that research uh, to make spacecraft fly. The challenge for the next generation of rockets is to go to, into deep space. That is to explore the outer planets, let's say starting with Mars, and then to go into interstellar travel. Chemical rockets simply do not contain enough energy per pound of fuel to enable those missions. The amount of antimatter in a matchbox could replace a boxcar of traditional nuclear fuels for powering spacecraft of the distant future. But until recently, there wasn't any way of taking antimatter to your rocket. It's a prototype instrument which we are just completing. It's designed to trap and hold 10 billion antiprotons for a period of up to 10 days. Our plans are to manufacture a much more substantial trap but will handle up to 1,000 billion antiprotons. That number is significant and will allow us to trigger microfusion reactions with antiprotons. And in turn, that would enable robust space missions. We're talking about very fast missions to Mars with a very substantial spacecraft delivering perhaps 100 metric tons to the surface of Mars with several astronauts in a very quick period of time, round trip 120 days. So antimatter suspended by magnetic and electric forces in supercooled thermos bottles could be the fuel for massive space liners. Once a second, the antimatter would detonate an explosion like a tiny hydrogen bomb. For now, though, the only crafts using antimatter are those belonging to the Star Trek fleet. And even they have their limitations.
By my calculations, we're going to need 50 years to get to Alpha Centauri using nuclear power, and uh, that will be even a great challenge. So if we want to bring the people back, that would be a 100 years round trip, and that exceeds the lifespan of most people that I've known in my lifetime. On the other hand, if we want to leave them out there, why, uh, that's something to think about. Antimatter really offers pretty much the only option to do an Alpha Centauri type mission in the time frame of interest. You always have to trade distance and time. It's, it's really a, a speed question. And then if you have more massive ship, it takes more energy to get your ship up to that speed. So antimatter, in my opinion, is the only thing that offers the potential unless you're willing to invoke some kind of new physics. Our universe has evolved over a long period of time and there are, there are mechanisms and forces that are responsible for that evolution. And the more we travel in space and look at these objects admittedly far away and study them, the more we'll know about our evolution and our origins. And that's why I'm an enthusiast for space exploration. One whose ideas may seem a little primitive to us today. There were so many things they didn't realize. That's not their fault. Somebody had to start somewhere. And anyway, the ambition to reach the heavens was the same. And if we're going to fulfill those ambitions still, we'll have to realize more things we don't now realize, or are only beginning to. According to the laws of physics known today, a space rocket ship can't pass that ultimate speed limit, the velocity of light. And the universe is so enormous that even light takes ages to travel from one part to another. But what about wormholes, time warps, other shortcuts through space? In a future age of breakthrough physics, these could be possibilities, perhaps. Who knows? We've discovered so much since the beginning of this century. Imagine how much more we have left to discover. Coming up, learn the real story. The exorcist really did exist, and we've got the facts. Then science goes into the realm of the unknown. Discover what's behind the last door. Life after death on Discovery Sunday, all coming up.